From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Betsy Johnson is trying to do something no woman in America has ever done. Win the race for governor without running with either major party. After decades as a registered Democrat, Johnson left the party to run as an unaffiliated candidate. She calls herself a no-nonsense independent leader who is only loyal to the people of Oregon. Will her message resonate with voters who polls show are fed up with current elected leaders? Will that support be enough to lift her above both the Democratic nominee, Tina Kotek, and the Republican nominee, Christine Drazen? Or will she be a spoiler and her votes take away from one party and help the other party win? We'll also ask her about her recent surprise appearance at TEDx Portland that caused quite a controversy. Here to give us her take and tell us why she thinks she is the best candidate to lead Oregon at a time when voters want a new direction. Welcome to my guest, former state senator from Scapoose, and it's expected she will soon qualify for the ballot as an unaffiliated candidate for Oregon Governor Betsy Johnson. Welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I think it's your first time here, so it's really nice to have you here. And we should mention, Betsy, that even though you've been running as a candidate for quite a while, you're not actually fully qualified for the ballot because you did go through the primary process with the parties, you have to collect uh, almost 24,000 signatures. That started last week. How's it going? It's going well. I have been overwhelmed by the enthusiasm. The Secretary of State's office allows us to begin collecting on June the 1st. And so prior to that, we were inundated with requests. Where's our petition? How do we get this petition? We're in the process of setting up what we call Betsy Brigades all over the state. That will be the kind of focal point for signature gathering. We've got boots on the ground, we've got events, we've got petitions out in people's hands right now. The, uh, the, the response has been overwhelmingly enthusiastic, which validates the whole point of this campaign. People are fed up. I think this is a unique opportunity point in time um, people used to joke with me about, are you ever going to run for governor? And my response had been, I'd rather throw myself in a wood chipper. But I think at this moment, there is an opening and people are eager for a change in our divisive, partisan, hyper-partisan politics. So we're very enthusiastic. Well, you're a native Oregonian. You were first elected to the legislature in 2000. You were known as a centrist Democrat. You probably would have won election easily as a state senator from your district. But why did you leave the legislature, leave the Democratic Party? Well, let me be absolutely ac accurate. I started out as a Republican. I grew up in a Republican family over in rural, it was then rural Oregon. Um, I left the Republicans when they went way too far to the right on issues like choice and gay rights. I then became a Democrat. Uh, one of my colleagues used to jokingly refer to me as a BFD, and I thought, same to you, fella, until I found out it meant business-friendly Democrat. And I proudly represented a working-class blue-collar district for a long time in the legislature. I left the D's because I watched them go way too far to the left on things like crime, on, on um, defunding the police, on disrespecting jobs and job creators. And given that most of my uh, district was working class, I just couldn't do that anymore. I believe that right now Oregonians are hungry for a different way of doing business. They want to find that Oregon mojo that I hope to bring back. When we talked about the halcyon days of Oregon, when we did pioneering things like the bottle bill and land use, and we were proud of our place. You could have the best beer here in town. You could have the best food in Oregon. And we prided ourselves. We've lost that. And people want it back. And they want it back without the extremes of the left and the right and this partisan gridlock that has kept us from moving forward. And you've got a couple of big endorsements from a Republican, former Senator Gordon Smith, from a Democrat, former Governor Ted Kulangoski, and just this week from former presidential candidate Andrew Yang. And then I just heard you got an endorsement from the Shans, Bill Shanley. Well, I think that is exhibit A in the whole case of my candidacy. These are people that are proud Democrats, proud Republicans, but they're saying we're willing to put this beyond the, the old allegiances and the old alliances. And that's how I'm running. Not as an R, not as a D, I'm running as an Oregonian. And I think people are hungry for that. 
I want to impart the sense of optimism that we can get back the Oregon that we had, where we're all proud to be here and pride ourselves on finding compromise, collaboration, and passing laws that work for everybody. We have to talk about your appearance at TEDx Portland a couple of weeks sure. ago. Are you surprised how controversial that appearance became? Oh, absolutely. They invited me. And the premise was that their banner was audacious ideas. And they uh, had basically articulated to me what is more audacious than running as a non-affiliated, rejecting the extremes of the right, rejecting the extremes of the left, and running as the people's candidate, putting the people back in charge. And I thought, great, so I accepted the invitation. Uh, they also spent the morning talking about how you needed safe places to talk about big, bold ideas. Well, unfortunately, when I got there, um, the big, bold idea didn't resonate with some of the audience, and they got kind of cranky about it. Uh, uh, but yes, I was surprised how controversial Well, it turns out that they may have violated federal tax code because they're a 501c3 nonprofit by inviting a political candidate. And then they did invite the other one, so people were upset about that. Technically, I'm not a candidate until... Well, but you've been running as yeah, a candidate really in, for months now, so it's really qualify. just a technicality. But you being a vocal gun owner and gun rights advocate and your appearance coming so soon after the mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde where 19 school children and two teachers were gunned down, the audience wanted you to talk about guns and gun safety, and, and they started calling for you to address the issue. Let's listen to what happened. Stop, stop, the, stop. The style of the gun doesn't dictate the lethality. But I think... They weren't happy with that. You said the style of the gun doesn't dictate the lethality. Do you really believe that an AR-15 style rifle is isn't as lethal as a handgun? No, I was trying to make a point and I did it stupidly. Uh, and I, I'll just say that, that was stupid. Um, let me start from the uh, premise that I have been a, a responsible gun owner and I have supported the Second Amendment. But I think what we're hearing nationally and here in Oregon is the need to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Irresponsible young people and, um, and people not mentally capable of handling weapons. Um, I very much support raising the age limit from 18 to 21 and I would enthusiastically uh, look at more aggressive background checks. Well, let's listen to uh, your voting record in the past because you said you are a gun owner and you've been vocal about gun rights and really your position has been absolute. You have an A from the NRA, which is not easy to get. You voted against every measure that's come up in the legislature. And let me just mention some of them. You voted against a 2015 expansion of background checks that you now say you support to cover private firearm transfers. You also voted against a 2017 bipartisan red flag law that was sponsored by a Republican that allows judges to issue extreme protection orders to require a person to surrender their firearms temporarily if they are a risk to themselves or others. And then just last year, you voted against the safe storage law. So now, two weeks after TEDx, when you were highly criticized, a lot of people are going to say these new positions sound like politically expedient, uh, a flip-flop. I reject that. It wasn't TEDx. Uh, it, it was Uvalde and the 10 shootings over the Memorial Day weekend and, uh, and Tulsa. Uh, I, I believe that the, the mood of the country is changing. The whole premise of my campaign has been let's bring people together in the middle to try to solve problems. And if I remain rigid in my views, um, I, I'm, I'm not true to a message of compromise and collaboration. Right now, the extreme left wants to take all the guns and defund the police. The extreme right wants this to just go away. I believe that I am uniquely suited to lead the conversation about how to get practicable solutions to the problem of having irresponsible young people with guns and, and people with lacking mental capacity to have guns. Well, Congress is considering a national red flag law. Would you support that? Well, that's going to be Congress's decision the same way they're talking about assault weapons. Um, my view is that we ought to try to achieve what we can achieve and do this incrementally rather than having the polarized conversation of gun, no gun. It is not, in my view, that simple. 
And um, I, I think that uh, by offering at least a, a middle place to talk about it, and given my track record, that I have the bona fides to draw people together and well, have the conversation. If we're looking for middle ground, um, a majority of Americans do support a ban on the sale of assault-style weapons. Would you ever consider supporting that? Again, I think that's the prerogative of the feds. Uh, we but have a. Could you, somebody, you know, let me just tell you about the faith leaders in Portland. They are trying to get that on the ballot. I, I know um, they are. So would you support that if they get that on the ballot if here it, in Oregon? If it goes on the ballot and the people pass it and I'm the governor, I'll enforce it. But would you vote for it? I don't know. Uh, and the reason that I say I don't know is that I don't know what the four corners of the page look like. And I generally don't commit to voting on something that I don't know all of the elements. It has to protect due process. I don't know how many subject matters are in these particular ballot measures. But the point that you should take away is I'm open to discussion and compromise. I'm not way over here on the left saying let's grab your guns. And once upon a time there was a bill in the legislature that would have authorized warrantless searches for guns. And I'm not over here on the on the right saying there's no movement and I just want this to go away I'm offering the opportunity to talk about this representing a perspective that um, I think could convene people well, let me throw something else out there would you would you support banning high-capacity magazines over 10 rounds again I think the feds are looking at that and that's in one of the ballot measures and if the ballot measure passes I will enforce that as governor but you're not sure if you'd vote for it until you look at it more closely I, I think that's fair I think trying to but in practicality I mean you could say I don't support having assault weapons semi-automatic weapons out there I don't support magazines over 10 rounds you don't have to look at all the details well I beg to differ I think the details matter uh, and um, the issue that I have is that we have to protect due process. I, I want to see what the four corners of the page say. What I'm offering and what I hope you take away is the chance to convene a conversation. Um, to shed the rigidity of saying let's not talk about this or let's just come at it from the perspective of taking guns away from law-abiding citizens um, I'm offering the opportunity to have a conversation. Do you think the NRA would what grade do you think they'll give you now? I don't care. You, you own a machine gun, an automatic weapon. Why, why do you own a machine gun? It is a historic Cold War artifact. My husband and I have collected guns. It, it hasn't been out of a safe in 20, 25 years. All the taxes are paid on it. It's all legally licensed. It's because of a federal permit. I yes, understand. yes, and fingerprints and all the rest. And it's, it's in the safest of safe storage. Um, we have an interesting collection of guns. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that we came into possession of the two guns that uh, Governor McCall's mother pawned in order to let him go to journalism school. Uh, and we had those guns in our collection and we gave them to the Oregon Historical Society so that they can be part of the permanent McCall collection. Nobody talks about about that. We've had a, a collection of guns, but uh, this old Cold War artifact um, was an interesting piece a million years ago, and it is safely locked up and protected vigilantly. I know another important component of, of gun safety and protecting our children's mental health, and I know that's oh, really God, important yes. to you. You and I have been at mental health events together. At the TEDx event, you talked about the need for a better mental health system, and that got a lot of applause. Let's listen. I think that we have so divided this debate on gun, no gun, that we're losing track of some of that stuff in the middle ground. And that stuff in the middle ground is we have, by any definition, a <laughs> mental health system. Had to, we had to bleep out how you describe the state's <laughs> mental health system. but I feel exactly <laughs> the same way about it, bleep notwithstanding. The legislature in the last two sessions passed what was called a historic package of bills to address behavioral health care of the state. Uh, I think it was a billion and a quarter dollars. They called it a game changer. Do you think it's going to make a difference? What would you do to improve the mental health care system if you're governor? Thank you for asking. Um, first of all, let's not call it a system. We don't have a system. I reject that characterization. And it is especially obvious that we don't have a system in rural Oregon. Um, the metropolitan areas have greater choices of uh, service providers. Rural Oregon, that gets pretty, pretty thin. 
Um, we need to do all sorts of things. Our state hospital is under federal scrutiny right now for their practices. Um, we have a paucity of providers. We have a workforce shortage that is exacerbating the, the, the lack of options. We have got to, with all of that money, have accountability. We've got to know that we made a difference. And I think the state, the well-fed state government, has been pretty slow to show up on some of this stuff. We've got money that is held in abeyance for a variety of things. We couldn't get unemployment checks out. We, we, there were lots of things we couldn't do. But in order to build a system, one of the things I think we have to have is measurable outcomes. And then the accountability and the timelines to say X has to be accomplished by this date. And if it isn't, let's get can do, want to, will do people who will effectuate those improvements. We talk about it, we appropriate money, and you just look in any street corner in Portland and it is clear we are failing. And so um, I, 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 right after the election, assuming I'm the governor, I would convene the appropriate people, mental health experts, accountable police, substance abuse. I believe this is a public health problem. Um, housing advocates, get them in a room and start talking about how do we really move people from the horror of the streets where people are dying and get them into the proper treatment level for whatever it is that their diagnosis uh, uh, mandates. We need a trauma-informed system and we need a data-driven system. Uh, and so um, that would be a very, very, very high priority. And you've touched on another high priority for, of yours is homelessness. It is. And you've said no more tent cities. How are you going to get 4,000 unsheltered people into shelters in Portland alone? Well, first of all, stop talking about it and start doing it. It has been my experience, particularly as I've been part of a group along with Jordan Schnitzer and other private philanthropists, in reanimating what was a jail, the old Wapato facility, and turning it into a place of recovery, hope, and healing, the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. And so I have been actively involved in helping to drive that outcome. Now, are the, do we have enough people out there? No. Um, I, we've got thousands of people on the street, as you just pointed out, but for the people that slept there this last week in a safe, dry, sheltered place with wraparound services and recovery plans tailored to their conditions, that is a godsend, and I'm very proud of it. And we have to say that's not a low barrier shelter, though. No, it isn't, and we've taken criticism for that, but I believe that um, there's a mix for all kinds of shelters. You can have emergency shelters where people can come in in any condition. Bybee Lakes happens to be what they refer to as a high barrier. We expect people to maintain their sobriety. We expect them to have a job. That's why we're building a child care center so that even single moms can go get a job. We expect them to pay something towards their room and board and the manifold services. I've gotten philanthropy to, to, to uh, donate a dental suite, so we're doing wraparound health care. Those services cost something, and I think when people invest in their own outcomes that they have a more heart connection with getting a good result. So um, that would be important. I, I think getting the tents off the streets, having ODOT come and clean their right-of-ways, paint the signs, um, act like we're open for business, and that this tent city situation is not something we can tolerate. The worst thing that's happening, in my view, is that we're all becoming numb to it. And that is an outrage. People are dying in the squalor and the terror of the streets. It is a clarion call to us to fix this. We have just a short time before we need to go to a break, Betsy, but I did want to uh, talk about Roe v. Wade. You're a pro-abortion rights candidate, and in light of the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion indicating the court may overturn Roe v. Wade, how important do you think that issue is going to be in the governor's race, and what sets you apart from the other pro-abortion rights candidate in this race, Tina Kotek? Well, I don't like characterizing it as pro-abortion, I like characterizing Rice. it as pro-choice. Uh, and I am. I served on a Planned Parenthood board. I am an, an unapologetic pro-choice person. Oregon is a pro-choice state. We will be. Uh, we have it in our statutes, uh, an articulation of policy. I don't think that we are going to elect an anti-choice governor in this state. I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and so um, I, I remain staunchly pro-choice. Betsy Johnson, it's time for us to take a break, but we'll continue our conversation in two minutes. Stick around.
Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter and welcome once again to my guest, unaffiliated candidate for Oregon Governor, Betsy Johnson. Once again, it's great to have you here. So much to talk about and we're, we don't have a lot more time, but I wanted to touch on climate because it's so important to so many people. And you're now being targeted by a Democratic backed pack called Oregonians for Ethics. The backers claim your claims and votes have been extreme and they hope to persuade Democrats not to vote for you. They say you played a critical role in killing action on climate change. Why did you vote against the bill in 2019 that would have capped and reduced the state's carbon emissions? It was a symbolic piece of legislation that would have put the burden of the costs of really some social engineering on the constituents that I was honored to represent in the legislature. These are people that work in natural resource economies. These are blue collar guys um, that are in many cases paycheck to paycheck. It was an extreme bill, again demonstrating how our symbolic politics and the vice grip of the two partisan parties have, have in this case cheated the climate. Um, I was very concerned about that bill and the economic burden that it would have put on the people I represented. I would point out that instead of fleeing the jurisdiction and heading out of Oregon, I stayed in the Senate and made my case uh, during that whole debate. Um, I believe climate change is real, and I believe that there are things that Oregonians and Oregon are uniquely positioned to do. Let's start with forests, our forest management. Every year, and it's gotten increasingly worse, we burn the place down. I think it is our responsibility to not have that happen. Those fires and conflagrations pump pollutants and smoke and, and all sorts of bad stuff into the air. We need to figure out how to fight fire better. Oregon has a nationally uh, earned reputation for initial attack. We need to harmonize how we fight fire with the feds that have a different philosophical view. We need to have the right air assets. We need to have the right uh, boots on the ground to do that. We need to thin, we need to cut, we need to prescriptive burn. We need to get our forests in better shape because they're really in pretty terrible shape right now. The other thing that we're uniquely positioned to do is innovate. We've got our powerhouse research institutions, Oregon Tech, OSU, PSU, are all partners in a thing that I helped found called OMIC, the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center. And we're trying to bring research and development in these critical green energy areas into the supply chain and to solve problems for business. Not theoretical research, but applied research. And so I'll just take Boeing airplanes, for example. If we can figure out how to make them fly lighter, greener, different kinds of fuels, um, if we can look to the ocean for wave generation, and I would say that without tearing up our fishing grounds, OSU has pioneered a small scale nuke. I was just out touring a wind uh, 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 generating in Ione, Oregon. Uh, Oregon Tech is doing electric cars and batteries. We can innovate our way back up to the top, and that's the kind of message as an economic development governor I want to send. We could be a leader in doing this. We don't have, we only have two minutes left, but I do want to touch on schools. So if you can do this in a minute, uh, just tell me how you would grade Oregon schools and what you would do as governor to improve our school system. Our schools are failing our kids. We're good at legalizing drugs and we're bad at educating our kids. When our kids don't meet the standards, what's the genius idea out of the, the, the union bosses and the governor's office? Lower the standards. We now have turned high school diplomas into participation certificates. We've, we've gotten away from focus on competencies in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and we need to get back to that. We need better oversight. We need better partnerships with local school boards. Teachers and parents are integral to this conversation. I think we're failing our kids and we're cheating them. So we haven't enough time for you to have your a final pitch to voters who are watching, Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated viewers, why they should vote for you, why you're the best candidate for this race. Good. Well, there's a reason why a proud Democrat like Governor Kulingowski and a proud former governor and a proud Republican like former governor, uh, former Senator Gordon Smith have put aside their party labels and said we need to do what's good for Oregon. Uh, um, Andrew Yang has just endorsed me for the same reason. His forward party is looking to end the vice grip of the extremes that have paralyzed our body politic. 
And so I think that speaks to what we're doing. Former uh, gubernatorial candidate Newt Bueller, former head of the Democratic Party, Margaret Carter, have all put aside party labels and are endorsing me. And I'm very pleased to announce that Bill Shonley, the Shans, has just endorsed me. Um, they all want a better Oregon, and that's what it boils down to, and that's what we're offering. Let's get rid of the extremes. Let's find that middle place again. Get Oregon's um, maverick spirit back, and they believe that I'm the guy to carry that message and that Oregonians are hungry to hear it. Or the, or the woman who's also a helicopter pilot. And I want to talk to you about that another time. We're out of time, Betsy Johnson. Thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. And we will have the other two candidates for Oregon governor on the show in the future. We want to thank you for watching. And we want to remind you also that you can get Straight Talk as a podcast. Just search for KGW Straight Talk wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.